This purgatory, deemed an island, is not so different from the world outside of it. As that one, the eight kingdoms, or simply the continents, is a chaotic one. As you've been told, this land has known war for centuries. That's why you took sail. For peace was so preciously near. Putting it simply, the continents wasn't perfect. No. But that's only a fraction of the whole story. More than war, discord, and chaos, the continents was a world influenced by order. Not order in man, of course, but order found in a primordial force that ever changed itself as the universe saw fit. It flowed like fire and housed knowledge as endless as the sky. Fire and sky, quite frankly, is a celestial realm with many residing in it. There are the gods who live there, of course, but the most notable of these residents were the candlelit, those who were born of a light that flickers like flame. Ephemeral beings, yes, but to be ephemeral, transient, to hold an ever-fleeting life was to truly be alive. And though that realm of fire and sky was distinct all its own, it wasn't exactly separate either. It was interconnected, weaving within itself and across the horizon of the corporal world. It was ethereal, in the truest sense of the word, delicate and light, in a way that seems too perfect. And perhaps it was, for how very much it is like for the sea to mirror what it gazes at in the sky. Second order and one that allowed life to cycle through the sea with birth and death as threads in the grand tapestry of the ocean. And from the seas came man who kindled life, so to speak, on the continents. As it happens, men weren't the only to be named saltborn. Be it their misguided spirits, the machinations of a major alchemist gone wrong, the evils to turn animals into nightmarish beasts, there were many creatures that shared their origin, but none aforementioned could even compare to the mightiest of them those of which who are referred to only as the deep. As the world so feared them, it was believed that even uttering their name could summon one, and thus remained unspeakable, even long after they've become lost to time itself. The hope that being forgotten is at least one way for something to truly die. Still, even with the absence of the unspeakable, the Kraken, the oak of man's fears were yet very alive. Those who were mighty in either brain or brawn possessed a strength to stave them off with steel or the wit to protect a nation. Others found they knew only to pray, and those who pitied such folk could never understand there was a limit to one's own strength. Those of the cloth, clergymen, as well as mages to a lesser extent, were adorned by those of the celestial realm. Lyrics, though typically peaceful, were always surrounded by spirits, often as playful as they are vengeful, and the connection between them was governed by their willpower. It was through meditation and focus that the faithful found salvation through pacts formed with gods, becoming instruments of divine retribution in turn. Ultimately, these pacts came in the guise of a prayer, and the prize for one to be answered was for one to be made to begin with. For with prayer comes faith which gives birth to devotion, and it is through devotion that gods obtain their influence. That influence doubles as their power and their lifeline. In short, the saltborn were to carry the gods' will and the god were to favor them, allowing them respite in their sanctuaries and many boons along with it. This was the very essence of their interdependence, the fundamental relationship between gods and man, the very foundation of creeds. To explore creeds more appropriately, let's go even further back. Far beyond most recorded history, there was a time when there were more gods to even count. Gods found in the forest and whose spirits dwelt within trees, worshipped by tribes who possessed no form of foundation in their beliefs in them. When man matured, so did a common pantheon, creating that of the old gods whom of which you may already heard of, Devara, as well as Diadel, goddess of the sky, and Asradak, god of bloodletting, along with nine other deities. There was Imbrios, Awema, Parabella, Numen, Grol, Elenestria, Oporus, Merlik, and lastly, Artilia. Modernly, this pantheon is known as Devara's Light, but those who still follow the ancient ways are deemed stone roots as tradition allows those to favor any of the old gods, twelve or otherwise. Beforehand, when it was Devar's light that shone in the East Continent, home of Livin and Ascaria, people could follow their own beliefs with little trouble, though everyone was familiar with the mother of the gods, the illuminator of all, or quite simply, the goddess of light. Everyone knew Devara, whatever title it may have been, those seeking her wanting nothing more than to find her heavenly embrace. Her most devoted often found sentiment in her kindness, becoming an extension of her grace, as such, the creed itself was almost stereotypical when it came to those from her cloth, though genuine through and through. Followers of Devar were always quick to extend a hand, while taking nothing in return. 
not even asking those to follow in her light, as those of her creed, as well as the goddess herself, simply valued peace. Much of the world followed this faith, for generations even, and most of the world gave their lives to her. But of course, if we were to remember what the old man told us, that is quite different than how things are now. Long after the creation of the old pantheon, decades worth of conquests, starting with King Rilith the Bear and ending with his son King Etro the Austere, is what eventually unified the nation of Ascaria. King Etro and his trusted knight Sir Omar found divine incarnation after death, becoming the king, the knight, and the judge of what will be known as the greatest creed to date, the three of the new gods. As a side note, nowhere in Section 9 Panthenus, where this information is derived from in the skill tree, does it explicitly state who the judge was, so I'm assuming it's implied to be King Raylan if not someone else altogether. Moving on, what's most peculiar is that the upbringing of this new forming religion was seemingly almost perfect, dare I even say, strategic, as if it was the very will of the world itself leading towards its success. And many of you may already know the ultimate reason as to why that is, but let's dig a little deeper. Firstly, the eastern continent itself was rich with arcane, both mystic and divine. While this home of worship started in living with the early stone roots, it was cultivated and consecrated in Devar's name, sanctuaries and shrines built in her honor. This was also around the time that aspiring mages from both nations created the citadel, hoping to master and understand the fire and sky that surrounds the world. While these soon-to-be-known keepers were neutral on all accounts, anyone could seek pilgrimage to learn from them, even an Ascarian mage per se. Secondly, Ascaria's military might is enough to hold against Tristan, a nation in the west continent they were with often, a nation that breeds only the best and sometimes cruelest warriors the eight kingdoms will ever know. Third, Ascaria's craftsmanship and diplomacy is enough to stay the hand of the Iron Council, the ruling government of their mountainous adversaries up north. Their nation, and doubly so for their capital, Markdor, is home to many precious and powerful minerals with skillful smiths able to put them to great use. But even they were outdone, unable to match the raw power and practicality of Ascaria's weaponry. Most notably, the great scissor known as the Jaws of Death. But more than a Dorian's aptitude for iron and steel, they were proud. For a rivaling nation to be able to make trade with them regularly, and buy territories in their minds no less, hopefully is enough for you to see Ascaria's ambition in full. But finally, even now, they are the lead in medicine and trade as well. While all curatives are derived from some form of red grass, prominent in the stone roots, the three's incandescent red is the most sought after, sometimes even found in a black market sold as red shards. Otherwise, Ascaria is home to a bustling market, often filled to the brim with merchants from all across the world, hoping to make profit from their wars. Hopefully this puts everything into perspective, that Ascaria wasn't just a nation unified by war. It thrived on it, and it wasn't just another powerful country either, they were competent. They held one of the greatest military powers to exist, wealth and ingenuity in both war and medicine, as well as having access to some of the world's strongest resources, with many nations and kings either forming alliances with, pledging allegiance to, or simply falling under them, it would make sense that when this nation declared their gods to be true, they would be faced with less than troublesome opposition. Though their influence was just beginning, the aftermath of the Three's advent, of their conquests, rippled throughout the rest of the world. But those who felt the full brunt of their power were, of course, followers of Devara. Just three generations after the advent of the new gods, the Great Unification Decree of Ascaria was ratified, deciding to remove all who would defy their worship. Many shrines and sanctuaries were seized and expunged in the name of the Three. Most of the continent was claimed, and there was very little to do but flee. It was these very events that led to the Pinsum Pilgrimage, where some scores of Devar's devout journeyed northward to live in, where the Three's power has not yet reached. The pilgrimage was successful, though even that piece did not last. Not long, anyway. Livin, just like the rest of the East, was consumed by the new gods eventually. The last of who followed Devar were scattered to the winds. Some, however, I believe were able to find refuge in Tanaber, further north. Though even if they did, such a settlement at that time would have been disadvantageous as well. Or perhaps the thought was already festering in Dorian minds, the actions of Ascaria may have been what finally made Markdor denounce the gods in full, worshipping instead the will of man. As ironic as it may be, this led to another religion all its own, the Creed of the Iron Ones, 
That may be a bit confusing, but take note that one doesn't necessarily need a god specifically for a creed to be formed or to even persist, just whatever may quantify as a higher power. For instance, the Keepers do not pray nor answer to Diadel but simply the sky itself. If there were to be a set rule, this power can only reside in the Arcane, or the Realm of Fire and Sky. To reiterate, though that realm is distinct from the Corporal, it's not exactly separate either. It's interconnected, weaving from across the horizon. Those of the Candlelit may pass the threshold into the Corporal world and the Saltborn may do so the same, but only in death, residing in the ethereal as sprites and spirits, unfortunately still unable to become Candlelit themselves. That aside, similar to the three finding divinity after death, so too did the kinsmen of Saltborn for the Iron Ones. Conveniently, human spirits are restless. Though they cannot directly influence the corporate world, they are eager to help those who ask their aid, while they are often fond of the clerics and the mages who summon them. Quote, the weak call out to divine powers for aid. We mountainsmiths are not weak. What we do have to call out to is the will of our ancestors. The will of dead heroes mends our flesh, gives us strength, and makes our weapons sing. End quote. The Iron Ones blamed the gods for the frailty of man. All dependent on them they came to be. And the Crusades of the Three, as well as another, brought out the worst of the Saltborn, I can't say for sure if the Iron Ones were right or wrong in their ideology. Part of me couldn't even say if such actions by the Three should be considered evil. But how could something almost instinctual, something decided by second nature, be called evil? Right or wrong, good or evil, there is one truth. But we won't be getting to that for a long while now. My gosh, after all these years, it's finally here. Sorry for how long it took, especially compared to how short this part was, but the next should be heftier by comparison. That said, for the sake of transparency, this first video was to simply introduce the world of the game, the second video will go over almost everything magic, and the last we'll be looking at the game on a more philosophical level while also trying to tie up the loose ends we made along the way. In doing so, we'll discover that truth together, eventually. Also, here's a bunch of disclaimers. I have not, at all, looked at any lore from Salt and Sacrifice, so keep in mind that though I'm basing this on the in-game lore, it is my own perspective, and I'm just conveying that to you. In layman terms, I could be wrong. Salt and Sacrifice may add some extra context to something which could ultimately make some claims false, or you may just disagree. At the end of the day, this lore series is still just a bunch of theories put together. All that considered, I hope you're looking forward to the next one. Like the video if you like the video, and as usual, peace.